evening everyone welcome to this special session on how to do practice questions but within the broader picture of self-study tips as you prepare for either your test one or your end of year examinations but before i proceed i just want to check for my co-host fungai whether we are now able to start and also whilst i'm doing that can you also please confirm whether you can hear me loud and clear uh, hi fungai uh Hi, Elliot. Um, I can hear you clearly. Okay, lovely. So I want to check whether we can start now. My clock is saying half five, but I'm um, seeing so- I think so we can start. The rest of the guys can join us um, on the way, but um, we are good on YouTube um, and we are also good on Zoom. So we can proceed and the rest can join us later. All right, thank you very much for that. So guys, once again, welcome to this special session where we're going to be focusing on self-study tips as you prepare for either your test one or your end of year examinations. And also please know that this session is going to be recorded and the recording will be made available to you once it's ready for circulation. So I hope you are going to find this session quite useful as you are going to be preparing for your studies. So what I've prepared for today, and what I'm calling my menu for today, or for this one hour session. So I'm going to quickly discuss, to say as you are going to be doing your revision, what should you be focusing on? Because at the end of the day, when you are going to be writing either your test one or your end of your examination, you are mainly worried about, how do I get that 50%? And that 50% is going to be likely a function of the quality of preparation that you do between now and the time you sit for your for examination. And then the second aspect in terms of my main that I'm going to discuss is how to do practice questions. Because you've noticed that most of you, as you're going to be doing your preparations, you're going to be doing a lot of tutorial questions or practice questions. But the question is, are we all clear on what we are supposed to be doing in order to get the most out of those particular practice questions. So I'll touch issues such as scenario analysis, interpretation of the required solution planning, as well as how to mark your own work after you've done your practice question. Then we'll wrap up by taking any questions that you might have to assist us in the preparation for, for our upcoming examinations. But I would also want to encourage you to ask any other questions you might have as far as your study technique and preparation are concerned. So I would want to emphasize that this session, I know at times when you see me, I'll be teaching math. So this session is not a math session, but rather we are going to be looking at general aspects that can help you in terms of, in terms of your examination preparedness. But I encourage you to make use of the Q&A platform as well as the chat room to post through any contributions that you might, be, that you might have as you take along in the class. Okay, so moving forward. And remember, please always feel free to stop me if you think I'm not talking too much or I've lost you along the way. I'll be more than willing to stop and take questions. So the question is, now that you are preparing for examination, some of us might have gotten some study leave from our employers if you're in the part-time program or if you're a full-time student, we are now on squat leave. So I just thought about what are some of the myths about examination preparation? And the reason why I'm calling the myth, I'm sure obviously a myth is not reality, but it can change the reality if you accept it as such. So what are some of the myths that I thought in my mind to say, when my students, when you as students are preparing for examinations, what are the things you need to be on the watch out for? So the first comment I have there is, I should focus on revising topics I struggle with. And I put this as a myth. Quite interesting. And I believe most of you might have different sentiments around that one. Say, but Elliot, it's quite obvious. My study timetable should be primarily focused on those areas that I'm not good at. But here I am, I'm saying it's a myth. And as you go with this session, I'm going to explain why I am of the opinion that this potential is a myth. Then secondly, I should be mentally prepared to tackle the difficult questions. So if this follows on from the first myth I've identified there. Because your preparation 
is wired towards you, preparing for the area that you struggle with. So it, by virtue of that, most of us are prepared to tackle, or when we are doing our preparations, we are focusing on preparing ourselves to tackle those difficult questions. But before I proceed, I'm just seeing a comment in the chat room from Sarah. She's indicating that she can't hear me. Is this a class-wide problem or not? If you can please just confirm for me. Okay. From Tapio, this end, I can hear you clearly. All right, thank you, Fungai. Tapio, I see your hand is up. Please go ahead and contribute. I've unmuted you. Hello, Tapiwa, are you there? Or oh, it was a hand up by mistake? If you can please just confirm for us. Yeah, it was, it was a mistake. Sorry for that. All right, not a problem. Then another myth that I've identified is sitting exams are hard and it's difficult to get 50% or they are difficult to, to pass. And again, I'm putting this as a, as a myth. I should go back and reread my module and textbooks. So for those who are writing their test one, starting the, the 6th of April, you will be asking yourself, what now at this stage? Should I go back to my module? Should I go back to my textbook? Should I go back to those pre-recorded pre -recorded lecture video, videos? So I hope some of the, the things that I'm going to be discussing with, with you today are going to de demystify these myths that I have identified for you here. But I think I would also want to encourage you, feel free. When you think, say, but Elliot, what you're saying there, that potentially focus on revising difficult topics is a myth. Therefore, what should I be doing as part of my exam preparation? And this, that brings me to the next segment of my, of my class, to say what therefore should be the focus. So before I explain, my thinking this table, I want to differentiate two processes. So there is examination preparation. I'm just going to say there's exam prep versus, and I'm going to put this as general study. So this general, so exam preparation, we are saying test to one, or your end of year exams are now two weeks away. So it means whatever studying you are now doing, is more focused on preparing for that particular examination or assessment. But then when you look at general study, that is the study we expect you to have been doing to prepare for your classes when you are doing your homeworks, ETC, which are focused. So general study is more focused around understanding principles. And that should, at this stage, general study should have already happened. Now we are getting to the stage whereby our primary focus is, I want to be exam ready. Come test one, come end of year examinations. So to, for me to be able to be exam ready, what should I be doing during this period? And I've got this table here, which tries to analyze the general contribution in terms of our examinations. So like I indicated at the beginning, we say, our mindset as students right now is, as I'm doing my preparation, I need to be worried about what topics or what areas am I struggling with? So that is a natural inclination that we have as human beings. So the moment you are preparing for anything, if it's management, accounting, and finance, someone can say, ah, I'm having challenges with standard costing. So I'm going to allocate most of my time studying standard costing. Or in financial accounting, someone might say, I'm struggling with highest calls, especially deferred tax arising from assessed losses. Therefore, when I'm looking at my studying timetable, I'm going to allocate the bulk of my time to those particular areas. But today I want to change that type of thinking and approach. And I'll explain my thinking using this table here to say for those that have done, I'm sure who are in their CTA too, or those who are in the July class preparing for their end of year examination. I'm sure if we are to assess all your hundred marker papers, it does not mean when you look at your 100 marker papers, not all the required are highly difficult. We are going to find that our papers are going to have a mix of easy to moderate required as well as difficult required. So what does this mean for us as far as our preparation is concerned? 
So when you do that analysis, if you are from an exam setting perspective, you will find that on average, 60% of the paper is going to be made up of easy to moderate questions. And then those questions that we term difficult will constitute about 40% of the, of the questions. So here we are looking at a 100 marker typical examination. And this is like an average distribution. Natasha, I see your hand is up. Do you want to share something? Natasha, I've asked to unmute you. You can just confirm if you want to contribute something. Okay, I guess it was in hand up by error. Okay, Natasha, I see you have unmuted. Sorry, that was a mistake. Okay, that's fine. So as I was explaining, so our exam, 60% easy to moderate, 40% difficult. So the question that I have for you today is, when then we are now preparing for that assessment, be it just one or end of year examination, how much time are we allocating to prepare for these easy to moderate questions? I'll give an example from a math perspective. Some can argue that I find business risks easy to moderate. And then my question to you is, how much time are you therefore allocating to prepare for questions on business risks to ensure that come exam time, you are exam fit for those types of questions? Or because you have said business risks are easy to moderate for you, you are not going to be preparing for questions on business risks. And they are saying, for example, I struggle with ABC. Therefore, I'm going to allocate most of my time to practice ABC-related questions. But the problem with that approach is, when that is the model question actually then does come in the examination, you are not, you are going to be, you are not going to be exam fit. Why? Because you've not allocated time to practice how to score marks in those easy to moderate questions. So I think even though they are easy to moderate, are you exam fit to be able to score marks in those particular questions? Or because you're focusing most of your time on difficult questions, and the challenge with the difficult questions is they're difficult. And by nature, when you look at difficult things, when they get them or not in the exam, I would say it's more of a 50-50. Or it's a gamble. You may get it right, or you may not get it right. So mentally-wise, what does it mean? So here, what I'm saying today is, as part of your exam preparation, I would want you to also allocate time to prepare for those areas that you think you are now comfortable with. And as part of your preparations, I'm saying when you're doing a practice question, for the easy to moderate questions, your target mark in terms of that question should be 70%. So let's say it's a required with 10 marks. If it's an easy to moderate required, the target should be for you to end what? 70% of the, of the marks. Then for the difficult required, I'm not saying don't practice them. You are practicing them and you are saying, okay, for a difficult question, I should be able to target at least, excuse me, 40% of the, of the marks. So if you do the math here, if I say for every easy to moderate question, I'm going to get 70% of the mark. You find that the weighted average contribution is going to be 42%, and for the difficult, it's going to be 16%. And your total mark will then give you a pass mark of 58%. And here we are saying it's a comfortable it will be a comfortable pass. So for those who are struggling with audio, please just cross-check your network from your end, because I think all the other guys can still hear me from their end. So I'm saying, looking at this approach, at the end of the examination, I have what? I have passed. So with that in mind, what do I... So with that in mind, what are some of the common pitfalls when as students we are preparing? Number one, being underprepared to score marks in easy to moderate questions. So we get into that exam room prepared for the difficult questions. To the extent that when the easy to moderate questions then actually come, we are underprepared and we then fail to score marks in those particular questions. Then secondly, 
Why is this happening? Because we are focusing on difficult concepts. And then another pitfall that we have, when we are defining to say something is difficult, one of the biggest problem in our definition of difficulty is our failure to be specific to say what exactly is difficult. So when I look at standard costing, and someone might say standard costing is hard, but don't put your, your level of difficulty at topic level. Why? Because the moment you're going to see a question of standard costing, you're going to have a mind block. Reason being, because you've told your mind that standard costing as a whole is difficult. But then if you go into the actual topic, you might see it's just specific issues with this standard costing that you struggled with. Struggled. An example could be, if you get a quiz of standard costing with normal loss, you're saying, I then struggle. But what does it mean? If you've got other issues that got nothing to do with normal loss, you should be able to address them. So it means when you're studying, always be specific to say, where do you struggle? What do you find difficult in a, in a topic? Why do you struggle with a, with a topic? Go into that deeper detail and not define level of difficulty at topic level. And I said, that's another common pitfall. And when you look at all these issues, it's a cocktail of issues. What does this result in? When you then go into that exam room, most of us are going to lack confidence. Why? Because all, the, all our preparation was focused on doing difficult questions or difficult concepts. And during our preparation, we're struggling with those difficult concepts. What happens getting the exam? Your mind, you've you got fear. And unfortunately, what then at times happens in the actual exam, you open your required, the first question you see, it's on standard costing. And all along, you've been feeding your mind that standard costing is difficult. It means chances are high at that stage you are going to experience a mind block. We are going to get paralyzed, mental paralysis. Why? Because that difficult topic that we are afraid of is then actually came. So how do we do our with this? My message here today is, please prepare for easy to moderate questions as much as you prepare for the difficult questions. Because if we do the math, the bulk of our paper is going to be made up of the easy to moderate questions. With the difficult questions only making up an average of 40% of the entire questions. So before I look at scenario analysis, someone can say, but Elliot, what you're talking about, how practical is it? I'm going to give you an example of IS score. I know most of us, when you see IS score from a PINDAC perspective, which is income taxes, we tend to freeze or we tend to get a mind block. But now I'm saying within IS score, I believe there are so many easy to moderate concepts. Yes, there'll be other complex concepts within IS score. So let's say hypothetical, within IS score, a require then ask you to do a tax rate record. So I've been asked to do a tax rate record. So the question is, when I'm looking at my tax rate record, we are now saying, what is the first thing that I need to put on my record? And what is the level of difficulty on that particular reconciliation? So just to summarize this, so I'm just going to put my table here. You are going to have your balance. I know I'm not a FINAC expert, so I'm not going to try to go into the technical detail. But I'm saying, when I look at the first line item, as part of your starting point for your recon, no matter that's a straightforward what? item. And I would say I would expect you to get one mark, but it should be easy because it would be given in this scenario. Then your final balance for recon, just for counts casting, most of the time you get your one principal mark. Then when you go into the actual reconciling items, the level of difficulty on the reconciling items would differ. You are going to have reconciling items that are 
may be quite straightforward. Why don't you have the marks on those easy reconciling items? Rather than telling yourself that IS scope is difficult, you can be specific that within IS scope on the text that record, what do I find to be difficult? So that when I then get in the actual examination, I'll be able to think fence. To say, when I look at IS code, I struggle with whereby there's been a change in text rate, record, reconciling item. So if your scenario then comes, brings about the issue of a, a text rate change, we are reconciling that, as, we are ring fencing that aspect of the record. And say, okay, I'm going to lose marks on this one. But on the other individual reconciling items, I'm going to be able to score my marks. So essentially what you have done is to break down a complex topic for into its smaller elements. And you are clear where you are going to be earning marks within the larger what topics. So in your mind, you are no longer saying IS scope is difficult. You are not saying within IS scope, if I get this specific aspect, it's a bit what complex. But for the purpose of the examination, I'm going to earn my marks elsewhere within the bigger picture of the what? Of the exam. So that is the type of model that you need to be able to use when you are breaking down complex issues within each particular question or topic that you are studying. How do I earn marks? How good am I at identifying the straightforward principles within each particular topic? And to illustrate this, I'm going to stop sharing a bit because I want to open another document with, with an example of a solution. Then I can then also practically illustrate what I am talking about. Because they say seeing is believing. And I know today since I'm dealing with the accountants, more so prospective CAs, I believe it would be good for me to visually show you how these things work. So I'm just looking for a, a typical example of a long calculative question that I can use to illustrate. So in the meantime, you guys, if you have any questions, please make sure you send them in the chat or in the Q&A. And for the guys on YouTube, you can also make use of the live chat. For those who are experiencing sound problems, the guys from YouTube are saying sound is good there. So you can try join via YouTube if you're facing any challenges on Zoom. Back to you, Elliot. Okay, guys, okay, thank you very much for the emphasis to the team. So remember, like I said, as I'm going through with this discussion, please feel free to ask any questions where you think I may need to clarify further in terms of what I mean as far as your examination approach and technique is concerned. So I've got a simple example here, whereby the required wanted you to perform a SWOT analysis. So let's say, hypothetically, I'm saying, but I do struggle with SWOT analysis. But I want you to break down SWOT analysis into each, its individual components. Because SWOT analysis is made up of four items, strengths, weaknesses, uh, opportunities, as well as threats. So then to ask yourself, which specific area do you struggle with within sort analysis? So if someone can say, I struggle with raising weaknesses. So what does that tell you in the examination? When you get in that exam, you know where you're going to be able to earn your marks. When you then focus more on your strength, your opportunities, as well as your threats. So it means this question would therefore not be a total write-off, but rather, you are clear where you are going to be able to end your marks. And your mind no longer focusing to say, this entire question is what is difficult. I hope that makes sense. Then I, if I go down, looking at this example, we had the evaluation question in this paper. And for those I'm sure who are in their CTA too, as well as the full-time July class, they can potentially say valuations, especially measures and acquisitions, are on the difficult side. But when you're attempting that question on valuation, ask yourself, what exactly am I doing? What valuation method is the most appropriate within this required? 
So in this example, the valuation method was the earnings-based valuation method. So one of the calculations that, that we had to do was to determine the, earning, the average earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. What are the sort of adjustments I need to do? Where are the easy marks? So if I look at this example, the revenue number was given. And then this now we are told that the company is currently operating, is expecting a margin growth of 5%. So how there a 38% margin within, after we post a major, 31% pre-major, 35% in the previous year. So we want to understand our post-major gross what? Profit. So the question is, when you look at these adjustments, you are no longer you are asking yourself, where do I end the easy marks within the bigger picture of the m and question? In your mind, you are not telling yourself that m and where exactly do I face challenges when I look at a major and acquisition type of question? So someone could say, I struggle with then the determination of exchange ratios. So if I look at this example, the exchange ratio calculation is only four marks out of a total of 24 marks. So as a student, you could actually pass this question without the need to calculate what or determine the exchange ratio. But you just end your marks elsewhere across the, the question. Okay, so I'll pause a bit and take some of the questions coming through the chat room. So I see a question from uh, Sam Tigere. We are facing challenges on what and how exactly should we flag or highlight in our handbooks. So obvious number one, I know handbooks are largely used in financial accounting, auditing, and taxation. And I believe the FINAC team, they've done a recording of how to go about flagging your handbooks or highlighting your handbooks. But to further add on to say, why do you need to flag? That is the first question you need to ask yourself. Let's say, for example, you are looking at IS score and you are about to flag a section on highlight. Ask yourself, what is the purpose of highlighting? Why am I doing it? So the reason is, in the examination, I need to have a quick reference point maybe to a key principle within the standard. So if you find yourself that you have more or less highlighted all the pages within the standard, then it means we have now see highlighting has lost its what intended purpose. Because when you now open the handbook, everything has been highlighted. So it means at the end of the day, it's not going to be useful for you. So highlighting is for the purpose of having a quick reference. What do you want to remind yourself quickly when you open that handbook? I'll say broadly to answer you, same they ask you always ask yourself, why do I need to highlight? So for certain things, you see that you not, don't need to highlight, but the principle we have co comprehensively understood it. So no need to highlight the standard where that principle is covered. Okay, another comment from my anonymous attendee. If I'm not yet comfortable with the financial calculator, can I bring a scientific calculator for CTA level one, test one? I'll say the type of calculator, it's your prerogative in terms of which type of calculator do you want to use. So long it is fit for purpose, you know, what you then want to do. So uh, there's no, we don't give a rule to say, some even actually come up with an editing machine. So just for the arithmetical editing, I just want to use my normal editing machine, which is still fine. But I still urge you to still find time to make sure that you understand that financial calculator because there are certain calculations where you can't use a scientific calculator, but you can, you should, the, the financial calculator is the only one which should be appropriate for certain types of calculations. Okay, Freeman Mazian, many times you have a challenge where you know the resulted part of requirement, but don't really know how to get where you know. That is, be work computation, you'll be very good with work, but debt cost computation might be a challenge. How do you navigate boss? So I think looking at your example, Freeman, that is where I was emphasizing. Remember, I think the biggest problem that we face as students is our expectation that we are going to totalize on each required. And I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, more often than not, we are not going to totalize 
when you get most of your requirements. So if I look at the comment raised by Freeman there, it means on the one counter he's saying, maybe I only start struggle with the dead cost, which is KD. So Freeman, what is that telling me? It means all the other components you have scored what? Max. So your cost of equity of scored max. Your market value of equity of scored max. Your market value of debt of scored what? Max. Maybe what you're struggling, struggling with is your cost of debt. And the only area that you are going to lose max, maybe it's just going to be three out of four. So in the bigger scheme of things, why do I need to lose sleep over the debt cost element? Because it's not the, my difficult area. I should rather focus on where I'm earning what? My max. When I end up, that required I would have passed. Because your target is for each required, you should be passing. So that at, at the end of the day, when then sum up your max, you are going to achieve that 50% target. Okay, so Freeman, I hope that he helps you a bit in terms of how to juggle difficult concepts within a, within a topic. A anonymous attendee, please assist on the wait for test to final exam. So on that one, I'm sure I think this must be from CTA one of the CTA full-time general intake. Uh, I'll ask the client service team to recirculate your student guide, which defines the weighting of your test, homeworks, and quizzes. So I'll ask the client service team to recirculate that document. But otherwise, if you go on my CAA under the client service folder, you'll find a document named student guide. That's where you'll find your weights for all the assessments you are going to be writing over the course of the year. Uh, just to add on that as well, Elliot, um, yes. if they go to their bulletins in the um, the previous two bulletins, this Friday, the last Friday and the last one before that, reference has been made to the student guide and all that information. So if you go to the bulletin, the Friday bulletin, you should find um, where to the information on where to find that information. All right, guys, thank you very much. And I hope uh, uh, you guys have gotten that feedback from Fungai, where to find information around your course weightings, in terms of your test as well as your quizzes and homeworks. Okay. So remember, what is the objective of this session? What should we be focusing on as far as our examination preparations are concerned? And I also see another question within the chat room to say, when I'm now marking my own work, should I restrict myself to the marking scheme? So I'll be discussing that in a bit when you look at saying, now how do I do a practice question? So which is what I think most of you are now doing. The key thing is you need to be doing that process correctly for you to get uh, the most benefit from the, from the exercise. But before I proceed, any questions so far on what I have covered, especially around what should be your focus area, how to, what you need to do to be able to break down a difficult topic into its minute detail, identify what are the easy aspects, what are the difficult aspects, where am I going to end my marks? Because from as far as exam preparation is concerned, it will not be all about scoring marks. How do I score max in that particular assessment? There is a question in the chat from Blessing. Maybe you can look at it. Okay, thank you, Fungai. So from Blessing, when marking, do you restrict yourself to your marking scheme or you can accept other sensible responses? I've noticed that some valid answers are not in the past marking schemes. So Blessing, I'll say, don't restrict yourself, but you need to be careful. And normally my advice is, as far as marking your work is concerned, I would encourage you to work in pairs and in groups, whereby when you're not then actually work marking what you have written, you give your colleague to mark what we've done. But from experience, what they've noticed that what we do as students, you write your suggested solution. And then when it comes to marking, more often than not, we are not marking what is actually sitting on our script but you are marking what's sitting in our heart, in our heads. Because the crux of the matter at the end of the day is when you're attending a solution, you are not writing the response for yourself. 
but you are trying to communicate with them with the marker. So whatever, and the marker is only going to be able to mark what's sitting on your script, which is why we, when you then, a child will then get, get feedback from students saying, but Elliot, when you get my answer, I think it's valid. But then I say, okay, when I read exactly what you wrote, it, your point is not addressing the required. But then someone says, but I was trying to say this. So the moment you find yourself telling whoever is marking your script that I was trying to say this, or you find yourself explaining or needing to explain your answer, it means chances are high you failed to communicate properly on your script. So which means one of the key aspects when we are doing our practice questions, we are practicing communication. How best should I communicate? Was well, at times you can say that this student potentially knew what they were supposed to do, but they failed to properly package their what their answer, which meant that they are failing to address the required due to poor communication, failure to properly weigh your solution points, which is an item that you always need to be on the lookout for when you are doing your practice questions. Practice communication. And communication includes such as such thing, such things as presentation. If as a marker I can't follow through what you're doing, definitely I will not be able to give you marks because of poor presentation. You have left me confused in terms of what you're trying to do. So it means the whole objective of doing your practice questions should also be to practice your presentation. How do I present a logical argument? Clarity of expression. How do I clearly articulate what I want to say? So I think that is the, some of the feedback or the issue that you need to be on the watch out for when doing those practice questions. Communication. Have you properly communicated what you wanted to say in the most convincing manner possible? So Fungai, I'm sure, is uh, someone who also has got experience in marking. Any comments and, and thoughts in terms of some of the issues we are noticing with students when it comes to communicating in their scripts? Yes, thank you, Elliot. Um, I don't have much to say. I think you have covered most of it. However, I would just want to say, um, going back to the comment made by Blessing, to say sometimes I think as students, we think of the answers which are too hard and we don't go for the easy ones which are within our grasp. So at the end of the day, you find that if most of your answers which are on your script are not on the suggested solution, it probably means you didn't apply yourself as well as you should have. So I think um, that's something you should just look at to make sure you apply yourself more. Ideally, at least two or three should not be on the marking scheme, not the bulk of them. I think that's on the only thing I can say. All right, and okay, thank you very much. And you also raised another important aspect to say as students, when we write our solution points, we tend to focus on the difficult points. And the reason being, for, and the reason for behind that is, it's because when you're doing our preparation, we also tend to focus on the difficult concepts. But like I said, unfortunately, when you look at the final exam contribution, the difficult concepts always contribute to the smaller aspects. If you look at the overall exam scheme of things, which means we then tend to lose a lot of marks by our inability to score in those easy to moderate points, our ability to raise those seemingly straightforward points. So in the exam, we fail to raise those points. Why? Because we are underprepared to be able to raise those particular points. Because our minds are only focused on the difficult aspects. So I think it's fair to emphasize the point that Fungai was raising, to say we tend just to focus on the difficult points. Anyway, now how do we do our practice questions? So I've identified three to four key aspects that I feel are very, very important 
when you are doing your practice questions. And the first one is, for all your CT examinations, we are going to be giving you scenarios that can range between six to 10 pages long. Okay, someone is asking, how do you determine easy to moderate concepts? And I say easy to moderate concepts, it's relative. Because someone can say, I find standard coursing to be easy to moderate. So that person, that's easy to moderate to them. But they may be, they're very good with their mathematics. And someone can say, I find the discursive questions easy to moderate. But I'm saying at the end of the day, given the amount of knowledge you have, we are going to have certain concepts that are easy to moderate to you and other concepts that are difficult for, for you. But I'm saying on average overall, easy to moderate who vary per student, but the contribution will be on average 60 to 80%. Uh, Fungai, you can shoot. Um, I'd like to also add on this one with regards to the moderate to easy. I was actually having a discussion with the student the other day. So it's not always also that if you find costing easy in that particular exam, it is, it is going to be easy. Sometimes it can be a familiar topic, but in that case, it's been asked in a difficult way. So it also comes to the way you comprehend your scenario as well as your required. Uh, the student who was saying costing is easy for me, but I focused on it in this particular exam, whereas in that exam, it was actually difficult. So sometimes costing may be easy, it may be hard, depending on the way that it's been asked. So it's a matter of being able to comprehend the scenario and required, and being able to say, in this case, this one looks difficult, this one looks hard. I think that's all for me, Elliot. All right, thank you, Fungai. So I'm sure at the end of the day, it all depends. So it's contextual. It also depends on your strengths as a, as a student by identifying what is difficult and what is easy to moderate. So as I was saying, your all your examination, they're going to be given a scenario which is on average six to 10 pages long. And there's a reason, there's a reason behind why we give you such long scenarios. But at the end of the day, all our case studies are based on some form of a business. So when they start to answer your questions, they should be within the context of that particular business. What does the business do? And I know specifically from a math perspective, for you to better understand what the business does, we, we cover a topic on building blocks of a business model. In the term, this can seem to be quite a fancy name, but at the end of the day, when I'm looking at a business, let's take, for example, if I look at a business such as uh, Old Mutual, I can simply ask myself, how does Old Mutual make its what? Its money. For me to understand Old Mutual as a business. And most of our case studies, Start by explaining the nature of business that is being conducted by that particular entity. And from the nature of the business, we then develop problems for you to be able to solve. Why is it important for your scenario analysis and comprehension? But at the end of the day, when we then give you that, for example, it's financial accounting, you've been asked to solve an IS score related problem. We'll be expecting you to solve that IS score problem within the context of the business that we have given you in the scenario. Which is why in CTA we say, you never get away with claiming or memory dumping. Why? Because a certain way you have done things in another question may not be applicable to the context you find in your examination scenario. So it means that at the end of the day, understanding the scenario, understanding the business, and when you then look at the scenario, broadly, our scenario is broken down into two main areas. So allow me just to wrap this. So whenever I look at our case study, or when we are setting our scenario, we tend to say, number one, we give you Kanban background information. The nature of incorporation of the Kanban is a private limited Kanban, is a public limited company, a time who are the shareholders, ETC. 
So in background, you can give an incorporation information. You can be given governance information in terms of how the company is structured. You can be given extracts from its strategy documents. So this just to allow you to understand the company. Then the second aspect, we are going to give you specific transactional information. So the transactional information could be, if I'm looking at map, the company is looking to expand to Botswana. So you can then give you further information around that particular proposed transaction. Or if it's a costing problem, we can then tell that this company is trying to cost. Uh, it's a phone manufacturing company, and they would want to determine the cost of making this what Android device. So that's not transactional information. So during the reading time, I would say primarily, you need to make sure you put a comprehensive understanding of the background information. Primarily. Then when you get the required, for each required that you get, most of the time, it's linked to specific transactional information in the scenario. So which means before you answer the question, you need to go back to the scenario to further understand that transaction that you, need, you then need to be able to solve the problem related to that particular transaction. Because from experience, what we have noticed is as time, as time as a student, we try to chew the scenario at this one word thing. Instead of breaking down into individual components that you can chew bit by bit. Background, what are the specific transactional information within the particular scenario? Which is why in some requirements, you can specifically say with reference to not three, can you do one, two, three, four things? So it means you need to go back to that not three, reread that not three to understand what's going on regarding the transaction documented in not three. Okay, I will pause a bit. So looking at our Q&A, someone is asking strategy required are not particularly difficult, but putting down the solution point take, tend to take time given the structure of the issues to be addressed. How best can you beat the time allocation for such required? And how brief can you be without losing the marks? As students, we tend to write so many words in fear of, of missing out on the clarity of the solution point. So number, my first response to your question is, you said strategy questions are not particularly difficult, but waiting the solution is a bit tricky. So my question is, as part of your exam prep, how much time are you allocating to prepare yourself to properly communicate or properly word strategy related solutions? Because if you are not putting enough time, by virtue of you saying the topic is easy, Definitely in the, in the exam, you're also going to struggle in properly wording the solution point. I said, that's number one. Then secondly, whenever you're looking at a solution point, it's very discussive question. You need to ask yourself for a valid solution point. What are the key things I need to bring? And I always love to, love to give an example of a question on risk. So for a valid point on risk, as markers, what we'll be looking for is, is the student identify the risk trigger plus the impact arising from that year, trigger. Trigger plus impact. How will the company be negatively impacted by the trigger you have identified? Then that becomes a what? A valid solution point. So in terms of how do you shorten your solution point? My answer to that is, is through practice. There's nothing I'll be able to tell you, say, do one, two, three, four things like a magic wand. It, it's about how you are communicating. So you are, how do you improve your ability to communicate through actually writing your questions, those seemingly easy questions. Take time to answer them so that you know how exactly to word a properly, uh, how to properly word a solution point. Okay, it attenders, are there any irrelevant paragraphs provided in the exam scenario? For example, on the work, weekend mock exam, we were only told to advise A, B, C on query one and three, but there are like five queries in the scenario. Yes, it's possible. 
which is why I'm emphasizing that within the during the reading time, when I look at your 10-page scenario, what you need to make sure you have understood during the reading time is this Kanban background information, incorporation information, uh, governance information, strategy documents, if there are any strategy information, if there's any. Why? Because at the end of the day, we are saying all the transaction that are, transaction information that you are going to be given is going to be within the context of the company's business model. So it means when you then get a required and it says, can you discuss ABC with the event to query one? It means for the purpose of answering that required, you now need to go and read query one and use the information query one to answer the required. But as you're answering the required, you need to keep the background information at the back of your mind because it's, it's the one that is giving the overall context of that particular case study. So Tatiana, which is why, so 30 minutes, you read the entire case study. After doing your first read through, pay special attention to the Kanban background information to allow you to understand the business model of that particular entity you would have gotten in the, in the examination. So to attend, I hope it helps. And I'm also just going to put up, as an example, your math scenario from, your, from the mock examinations you wrote over the weekend. I'm just checking for my, uh, where did I open the math scenario? Many times technology can decide to, to misbehave. Okay, so I hope on your screens, you can see one of the scenarios that you got. So if I look at this case study, the entire page one, we've got a company ceramic private tiling production, private limited. So the nature of incorporation of the company is a private limited entity. So it means if I'm going to get, for example, a question on strategy, the, the corner that the company is a private limited company is very important when I'm not doing a strategy related question. And what does the company do? It produces and retail ceramic tells. It produces. So it potentially means they manufacture the tell, the tells. Retails this is the actual selling of the what of the towels for which market specifically for domestic use. So here I'm understanding the company's business model. Who are the company's targeted customers? It's your home consumers. So if I'm looking at the maybe I'm, I've gotten a question around if it's 50 revenue recognition, I've gotten a question on tech on text, but I've gotten a question on math. That content is very important. Established 25 years ago by the Smith family and has been operating relatively successful since then. It's a family owned business. So most likely an owner managed company. Where does it operate from? Factory grad side in Harare. Two retail outlets, one in Harare and one in Blawai. So if you go through this whole page, it's just giving you the background of what CTP how it's structured into its various divisions. And then when you go to this page, concerns regarding the floor tiling division. So at this stage, this is the example of transactional information I was talking about. So during the reading time, I may not necessarily get a comprehensive understanding of the exact concern that were being raised there. But then I'm saying, when I get the a required, let's say, for example, I've been asked to critically evaluate the performance of one of the divisions being the FT division for the year ended 2017 and 2018. It means I now need to go back to the transactional information relative to what related to the FT division and further read to understand what was going on with the FT division. Then I should be able to go back and answer required. So it means when I start my writing, I we don't expect you to go back and reread this background information. 
he should have assimilated it during the reading time rather than trying to do it when you are now actually writing. So that's what I mean when I was to you. That's what I meant when I was saying our case study we have background information plus transactional information. So then I assist you as part of your scenario comprehension. Background information, understand the campus business model, incorporation status, any governance structures, etc. Then when you go into the transactional information, that one again now is linked to specific requirements when the writing time then starts. So any questions just on scenario comprehension? What are some of the issues that you encounter as far as scenario comprehension are concerned? And Funga, I don't know if you want to add anything just from a general scenario comparison that our students also need to be on the lookout for. I think you have covered everything, Elliot. And how do you say that in the middle, Funga? I've got some Kalanga and uh, Izulu <laughs> students here. Uh, maybe you can translate for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working on my Ndebele. Very soon I'll be able to have a full conversation in the bill. All right, so if there are no questions on scenario analysis, the next thing that then comes through is part of our exam technique. Now I've gotten the required. How do I interpret the required? Yes, yeah, somebody is going to be asked, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't even read what has been written in the belly there, the QA. I will not even attempt. I will ask one of my esteemed Nebeli colleagues to say it out for me. And I will send you a voice note once I'm, I'm able to properly say it. So after 30 minutes, you are going to get your requirement. And your requirement is essentially a set of instructions of what you are expected to do. So there's no way you are going to pass an examination without understand, understanding what you have been asked to, to do. So someone will say, so I, I'm seeing some comments in the Q&A. There are certain technical ways that medical products such as tetoscope that tend to drain you. What do you suggest as a resolution to maintain concentration? So, when you look at those, some of those words, at the end of the day, we're just saying a stethoscope is a product. That's all. So maybe when you are reading your scenario, just circle that word and say product. This is what they say. So don't worry about understanding how it works, etc. But like you are currently saying, it will, it will make you digress from the core of the case study. What you just then need to understand is this product, Maybe it's a costing question. What are the raw materials or input that go into the production of that particular product? But at the end of the day, it's just a product. And they've also noticed where we think a particular word is fundamental to understanding of the case study. You will see that in some of our case studies, we then put a footnote to further explain some of these complex uh, terms. But otherwise, as much as possible, those complex words may be just a name of a product. Don't worry about the complexity of the name. It is just a name. In the exam, you can actually decide to name it different. Just say product S. And if that's going to make you better understand the product, do it. Say, for me, stethoscope is just product S. So I hope that makes sense there, Freeman. Then I think I understand it better if I get the required first. So I'm saying in the examination, guys, the structure is you are going to get required after 30 minutes. So it means as you look at your scenario, ask yourself, what do I need to focus on during the reading time? And my emphasis there is let's focus more on the background understanding the business. The transactional information, we can then further reread it once we get our required. And essentially, the required is giving us a problem to solve, which is the main purpose of the required. So I was then discussing, say, a required is an instruction. 
what are you supposed to do? And when you're getting an instruction, how best you interpret or understand an instruction? So the best way to understand or to be able to work on your interpreting, interpreting the required skills, ask yourself, what is the output which is required? Because they're simply saying, at the end of the day, if I execute on this instruction, what is the expected output? Because I know most of the time as students, we tend to focus more on the inputs, which will then result in us losing sight of the actual expected output. So let me illustrate this by looking at some of the requires that were part of your mock examination that you, some of you wrote during the weekend. So I'll start with the auditing required. So remember we are saying an instruction, a required is an instruction. So here it's saying with reference to background information. So normally, like I said, this is your company, general information. And the information in note one, so it means for the purpose of answering this required, I need to go back to the background information and not one. So using that information, what should I do? Excuse me, describe the procedures that would have been performed by COSE as part of the client acceptance decision making process. So looking at this instruction, whatever I do, the output that is expected is a procedure. And that procedure, why was it performed? It was part of our, us gathering audit evidence as part of client acceptance decision. So when I go back and read what you write on your script, I need to be reading a procedure at a minimum. Because the time is very easy to start writing or answering question what? A1, so instead to answer question A2 and A1. So instead of writing procedures, you start writing factors. So when I look at procedures, or I'm think of ways such as inquire, inspect, observe, re-perform where applicable, if it is from an auditing perspective. Then required to then say, discuss the key factors that would have been considered by COSEC before accepting NetPlay as an audit client. So I hope you are seeing the, the key distinct difference between A1 and A2. A1 wants procedures. A2, we want factors. But then you see everything else is more or less similar. But if you miss this key aspect of the instruction, that's where you can then find in your script, you are going to get those annotations meaning irrelevant points. When we are saying what you have written is not addressing the instruction that you got. What is my output? It's a procedure. What is my output? It's a key factor. So your interpreting of the required should always be output driven. And even when you look at the required B, Discuss any ethical concerns you may have regarding net place conduct in connection with information not to. What is the expected output? Ethical concerns. Whatever I write on my script, I should be writing an ethical con concern. Within what context I need to go to not to. Okay, so I see a quest comment from Gary Kai. Hi, Elliot, is it not reading the scenario twice if you give us the required after reading the case study? So yes, definitely Gary Kai, after 30 minutes reading time, I want to emphasize this. There is no way you are going to remember everything in that scenario. It's humanly impossible. I will repeat, just after 30 minutes, there's no way you are going to remember eight to 10 pages of information. It's impossible. So what does this mean? For each required, we are now going to the specific, to the relevant section of the scenario and re-reading before you actually start writing. 
Well, like I'm emphasizing, your answers should be within the context of what has been said in this scenario. So now look at these ethical concerns. Within what context? What have I been told not to? When I look at these procedures, within what context? Within the background information and not one. So it means that, you, that then allows you that each point that you raise is going to be relevant in answering the required. To further illustrate, I'll quickly also read the math required. It said, critically evaluate the performance of the FT division for the three years ended 2017, for the years ended 2017 and 2018. Your evaluation must include a wide range of supporting calculations. Please note that 20 marks will be awarded for calculations. So what is my output? So obviously, one of the output is a calculation. And the calculation, what have they said here? It's supporting what? My evaluation. So the core of the task is I want to evaluate what? Performance. So the points I'm going to raise are going to about how did the FT division perform in 2017 and 2018? And to support my discussion, I need to have calculation. So it means whatever calculation that I have should be relevant in my evaluation of the performance. Okay, Pusisa Kunene are saying, why can we not have the scenario and the required at the same time and we decide how to utilize the time? So Pusisa, here we are now, uh, what can I see? We are now arguing with things that we can change. So here I've told you how the exam is structured. And what does that tell you? You need to prepare for the structure that you are going to see in the exam, not for the structure that you want. What the danger is, if in your preparation you're going to argue, say it doesn't work for me to first get the scenario and require it later on. But yet in the actual test, that's what you're going to get. It means when you get in that exam room, you are going to be underprepared. So the reality of what you're going to face in your city examinations, 30 minutes reading time. After 30 minutes, you get your required. And that's the exam same thing you're going to see at your ITC. There's 30 minutes reading time. After the reading time, you then get your required. So your practice, you need to be practicing for that type of examination setup. So from guys, we can jump in on this one. Just to re-emphasize the structure of our CT examination as well as the ITC examination. Uh, okay, Elliot. Um, I think for this one, we also have to appreciate that we are guided by um, the exam that you're going to write, the board exam that you're going to write. And I always say that CTA is basically a one long preparation course for your ITC. So whatever that we do here is to prepare you for the ITC so that when you go there, you write it once and you pass. Um, so I think on that one, I would, I would really just go with what she said that uh, acceptance is the best <laughs> medicine. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fungai. So I think I, the key thing is at least you know what to expect come the examination. It's not a secret, which is why we had really hoped that you would have taken time to attend the mock examination that we shared with you over the weekend so that you can already practice what you are going to expect come what exam time. So please, please take note of that, isn't it? So in the exam, are we going to get the scenario first, then the required later after 30 minutes? Yes, confirmed. Scenario first, then exam after the first 30 minutes. All right, so once you are done with interpreting your required, the next thing is, how am I going to answer the question? So this is what we are now calling solution planning. And solution planning is simply saying, you've got a clear idea of how and where you are going to end your marks. How and where you are going to end your marks. Let's say, and here I'm going to use an accounting question. 
let's say the, it's an accounting problem. And you've been, you've been asked to discuss the accounting treatment. Accounting treatment. Let's say it's in terms of, it's an intangible asset, IS, maybe the expense, or in terms of IS 38. So as part of my solution planning, simply question simply said, I need to discuss the accounting treatment. I'm going to ask myself, what are the key things I need to worry about when I'm looking at accounting treatment? I'm going to worry about classification. I'm going to worry about recognition or recognition, as some might say. For me, I'm a, I'm a boy with a strong raw background, so I go recognition. Then after recognition, you've got your initial measurement. You've got your subsequent measurement. Maybe you've got your what? Your disclosure. So you know this is where you're going to get your marks. So as part of solution planning, someone can say, okay, classification I'm comfortable with. I'm going to get my marks. But recognition, mm, my one. So you, know, you already know as you're doing your planning. Initial measurement, I'm comfortable. So I'm going to score. Maybe subsequent measurement, I will struggle a bit. But disclosure, I'm comfortable. So as you're doing your planning, you already know where your marks are going to come from. So it means this discussion, I know I'm going to score my marks in, on classification, initial measurement, as well as disclosure. Because if you don't have this plan and you just start to write, you are going to find that more often than not, you're going to be all over the place without you knowing where you're going to end your marks and your argument or discussion will not also have a, what? a flaw. If you don't have this type of structure is part of your solution planning. So the key thing is you want to have structure. Secondly, you also want to be clear on where you are going to be ending your, your max. So that is the most important aspect when it comes to solution planning. So I will again look at our mock examinations and quickly illustrate this. If I look at the, I'm looking at the auditing solution. Describe the procedures. What do we need to, to do? So as part of my solution plan, I'm going to ask myself, as part of the procedures, because the procedure is the order wants to gather what evidence. So the part of the solution planning is, I need to confirm does a vacancy exist? So what procedures should I perform to check for vacancy? Isn't it? Then secondly, I would need to assess management's integrity. What procedures am I going to perform to assess what integrity? And all these areas are coming from your knowledge of the principles. I would need to check whether in terms of ethical compliance, so your order, you're looking at your CPC. If I accept this client, we, not, we, didn't, we did not create any threats to comply with the fundamental principles. Then you perform your procedures. So personally, I'm a fan of using subheadings as part of your solution planning. So I've got a subheading of procedure that addresses does a vacant exist. I perform my procedures. I will need to assess management's integrity. What procedures am I going to perform? Are we going to be able to comply with all ethical requirements? What procedures are we going to, to perform? Do we have the expertise? What procedures are we going to, to perform? So all these things, it means you have given yourself a structure. And that is what you are working on when you are doing your practice question. You are practicing solution planning. How and where do you score your, your marks? Okay. So I see a comment say, if I know in my plan that I will score more marks in part 1B than 1A, is it okay to start answering the question ahead then come back later? Yes, it is very much okay. Because remember back in the end theory, start with what you are comfortable with. If you can see that from what your analysis, 1B is more manageable for you, please start with 1B and quickly end your marks back in the end theory. 
Did someone ask, will I be allowed to write on the question paper during the reading time? So during the reading time, you can do whatever you want with your question, with your scenario question paper. If you want to tear it up in the in anger, it's up to you, you're allowed. If you want to write on it, you want to do this on it, you're allowed. What you are not permitted to do is to write in the actual script during the 30 minutes reading time. Hope that clarifies. So solution planning, key and very, very important before you start to actually write any solution point. Well, the solution plan is the one which is telling you where and how you are going to be, where and how you are going to end your marks. And uh, I'll go back, I'm just looking for a blank page, hope I'll find one. I'll just go back to say at the beginning there was a comment raised on work. Let's say a question requires you to determine work. So as part of your solution planning, you are now saying, what are the sources of capital within my case study? Okay, do I have equity? And in, on debt, maybe I've got a, a normal loan. I also have preference case as part of my debt instruments. And for my work, for cost of for equity, I will need to determine my cost of equity. I'll also need to determine my market value of equity. For the loan, again, I need to determine the cost of the loan, KD. I'll also need to determine the market value of the debt. The same for preference shares. And once you've done this analysis from the information provided, which input to your work is easy to calculate? Start off with the easy input. So let's say, for example, KE is complex. Please don't touch it as your first calculation. Let's say I put a market value of equity is the easiest one. Start off with it and end your marks. And if market value of debt is also easy, calculate and put it in the bank. The same with KD. So that you are very clear where you are going to be ending your max. And you are also very clear which areas are easy to model to, to you within the overall work calculation. Okay. So saying bed in the end here, you have cash in before you go anywhere. Uh, kindly assist. What, what's the reading strategy to implement when one is not giving time, given time off from work and works too late? Now exams are near and there's no much time to attempt questions. What can I do? On that one, unfortunately, you have to create time. Because if you don't have, if you have not prepared, it means chances are high you're going to struggle in the test. So on that one, if you fail to negotiate with the employer for them to be able to give you time off, it might mean you have to burn the midnight candle because you need the preparation. On that one, there's no other advice I can give you. You just need to create time from somewhere. Okay, are you allowed to open your handbook during the reading time? Yes, you are permitted to. To read through ETC, but you're not allowed to write any, any notes ETC within the actual handbooks. Okay, so once I've done my solution planning, I know this session was supposed to be up to 6.30 and I'm not doing that well on time. Unkai, you can jump in. Um, I, have, I think I have more of a question to the person who was asking about um, opening handbooks during reading time. I think my question is, what will you be looking at in the <laughs> handbooks during reading time? Because you don't know what the required is yet. So I think, well, maybe sometimes you can preempt, but um, I've always told people that if you see yourself in an exam going to your handbook way too much, then you're probably not very prepared. Thank you for that comment, Fuka and sentiment. Say, what are you looking for during the reading time? You don't have the required, you don't have a problem to solve as yet. So rather focus more on understanding or comprehending the scenario. Well, the risk is if you try to preempt the required and the required doesn't come in the manner that you had anticipated, you will see that a student then try to force that solution that you had come up with during the reading time to a required that is no longer applicable to that what solution. So following up on Fungai, our advice is during reading time, please focus more on making sure you have completely comprehended the 
scenario. Okay, am I another question? Am I allowed to highlight on BD? Yes, you are allowed to highlight, underline, make notes on your scenario ETC. You are allowed. What will happen if I don't use the handbook in my study and I does and I don't go within the exam, particularly for test one? So the question, remember the whole idea behind those handbooks. I'll tell you my personal experience during my time as a CTS student. In the actual exam, I never used the handbook because I was never a fan of going through the handbook. Because I live for that would then take too much of my time. I would, I would trust the quality of my preparation for the exam. So that I've done the study, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. So it means when I actually start to write, let me focus more on understanding the scenario, understanding the required, and then actually time to answer. So as Fungai was alluding to earlier, the more you find yourself referring to your handbook during the exam, it means chances are high you are underprepared for that particular exam. So it's all in the preparation, preparation, preparation. We can never subcontract preparation to open your handbooks in the examination. Okay. So someone, is it possible to go to the exam without opening any handbook and going to pass? Yes, it's very much possible. It can actually get a distinction without opening those handbooks. Anyway, just to wrap up, I'll tell you how to do our practice questions. So I think I've touched briefly around how, what then should you be doing as far as then marking your own work? So the biggest challenge with regarding marking your own work is the issue around objectivity. To say when they start to mark, you might just end up marking what's sitting in your head and not what you've actually written. Which is why my recommendation is, is please have a colleague, have a study group where you can mark each other scripts. So it means when you are now revising your, you've done a practice question, as part of the revision, actually take time to mark each other scripts and score each other. Say for this question, how much did you get? Why? Because remember I said, this, these are our targets when you are doing our practice question. So you already need to start keeping track on how, you are, how well you are performing as far as these targets are concerned. On a quiz that you showed, you're comfortable in your writing. How much did you score? On a quiz that you struggled with, how much did you score? And when you go back to the scenario, please don't cram the scenario. If you see a solution point, that is on our suggest solution, but you didn't write, ask yourself why. Why was this solution point raised in, this, in our suggest solution? And to answer the why, it means what was said in the scenario that made that solution point valid for that question. And then ask yourself, why did you miss it? What did you miss in the scenario? And not to claim, say, okay, this time they added back depreciation. And they are sucking your thumb and say, okay, next time I see depreciation, I'm going to add back. But maybe in that next scenario, you're not even supposed to add back depreciation because the context has been changed. So always look at the solution within the context of the case study. The solution is only as good as the information provided in the scenario. So for those who love to use the OER approach, so you're just going through and reading the solutions, you, you will be wasting your time. You mark yourself against the solution within the context of the scenario. So I see I've uh, seen another comment in the chat room. Will I be penalized for not writing mock tests due to work little pressure? Ladies and gentlemen, the mock exam was given to you for your own benefit. Remember, as a student, you are, you are in charge of your own learning. And if you do not participate in the activity that we give you, the result of the non-participation will simply show when test and examination times come because you won't be prepared. Whenever you're doing all these things, it is just for the sole purpose of assisting you in your study. This is no longer primary school where we are going to come after you with a, with a stick. 
You say, if you didn't do the homework or you are going to beat you up. At the end of the day, if you don't put in the work, the result will simply show. If we say, guys, here's a mock, we think it will help you to prepare for test one. Create time to do that mock. If you are going to find comfort and say, but I was under pressure at work, okay, it's fine. But it's not going to change the exam at the end of the day. You are still going to struggle. Why? Because you didn't, you did not prepare. So that is my advice to you as far as the work that we give you. We are not doing it for us. We are doing it for yourself. You want to be prepared. So if we can quickly remove that misconception that all these activities you are doing for us, it's for you as the student to be better prepared for the exam. Okay. So I think Fungai can also jump in in terms just overall comment around uh, the activity that we are giving to students, one makes quizzes as well as the recently, the mock that we gave them over the weekend. All right, uh, thank you, Elliot. So from my side, guys, I'll just like to emphasize on the importance of the extra support that we're giving you. There's a lot at your disposal. And I believe that if you use it all to the fullest, you should be able to um, successfully complete your CTA. Um, we have your consults. Um, the reports coming so far are not, they ha uh, there hasn't been much uptake for the consult as we would want it to be like. So we encourage you to consult with your lecturers if you're facing any difficulties. Of course, it's not going to be a repeat lecture, but it's just to assist you when you might be facing um, any confusion. Then we also have homeworks and quizzes. The purpose of these homeworks and quizzes is such that you can revise what you've already learned and you can also gauge where you are um, in terms of a particular topic and where you're falling behind. This is where you can tell the, the birds that you have in your hand if you actually do this diligently. And they are meant to help you revise most of the topics that you have done. So please make sure that you do them diligently. Um, we also have the mock exams over the weekend. Unfortunately, our participation was not as high as we would have wanted it to be, but um, I, you can still go on and do these mocks at your own time and make sure that you revise them um, diligently as also has been prescribed by Elliot in this session, because it's really meant to simulate what you're going to see in the exam, not the actual questions, uh, but rather the exam environment and how you're going to answer it from. So make sure that when you actually at, um, attempt these mock exams during your own time, make sure you do them under strict timed conditions, strict exam conditions, so that you can get the benefit that we intend to give you. And then we also had this session. This is the first of its kind, uh, but it was meant to complement the mock exams that were there over the weekend. So that as you now prepare for your test one, you have all the support that you need. So please just make sure you use them to the fullest. Make sure you use your uh, lecturers to the fullest. And I'm sure if you do this, you should be fine. Yes, that's all from me, um, Elliot. All right, thank you, Fungai, for that emphasis in terms of the uh, importance of students participating in the activities. Remember, as your lecturers, we are here to facilitate your learning. So it means the bulk of the learning should be driven by you, not by us as your lecturers. So, Taura, I see your hand is up. You can go ahead and contribute. So, all right, do you want to share anything or it's in hand up by mistake? So whilst you're waiting for Taurai, I'll just go through some questions in the chat within the Q&A. So the father is asking how do I do? Can you hear me now? Yes, Taurai, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. My question, especially on the consult, eh? Is it yes. possible that when I've got a challenge, I send it maybe on WhatsApp, then you can just respond? Is it possible without me now booking that um, slot time? 
Okay, I would say, um, okay, what would love, if we look at your WhatsApp group, would also love you to say you've got issues. Make use of your colleagues. Because you find some of the answers are going to be within you as students. But if you yes. want specific feedback from a lecturer, because obviously I said the lecture is not, it does not necessarily mean that all the time they're just on standby to be, to be responding to questions on WhatsApp, isn't it? Which is why to yes. just structure the process would then prefer you maybe to just to go to my side and a But what we want to emphasize also is the bulk of the learning should actually be happening amongst yourself. We expect to see a lot of discussions happening amongst yourself on those WhatsApp groups. Because you know yes. that what you know that the next person might know, what you don't know, or the other person. So as you are helping each other by asking this question, you can then also learn in the process without necessarily waiting for a lecture. So Taura, I hope that helps in terms of how to go about the process. Hello, Taura, if you can please move closer to your mic. Uh, I think we've lost Taurai, so I hope she managed to get my response on that one. So I see a comment from Par. How do I distinguish actions be taken when I encounter a no club for eight marks and that for 20 marks? So here we refer, like I was emphasizing, an eight marker, what drives the number of marks? Is the information provided in the scenario. So when you find a no club that is going to require eight marks, it means you have been given less triggers in the scenario versus a no clock question that is saying, can we have 20 marks? So it's about the trigger as well as the specific instruction, excuse me, in the required. So a required can say, if I look, use an example of business risks, it can say, identify business risks and the mitigate your measures. Based on the required, it simply says, can you describe the business risks? The first required will definitely have more marks than the second one. Because the first one is going a step further by saying, come up with the recommendation for mitigatory measures. So which means understanding the output required is very important. Ability to identify triggers in the scenario is also very important for you to be able to generate enough points. So Faro, hope that helps. Then from anonymous, will I be penalized for not having the financial account in the exam? So anonymous, no, you will not be penalized for not having a financial calculator. All right. So as you wrap up, I think my final words is, I just picked up this quote. It's better for just looking at it from a learning perspective. Mistakes are meant for learning and not repeating. So what is this? what does this mean? As we are doing our practice questions and preparing for, for the exam, please make a lot of mistakes. But that is the only way you are going to learn. So if you are not, if you are not doing anything, it will chance are higher, you are not going to be making any mistakes. So the idea is by the time you go to the actual exam test one or end of year, you have done a, you, you have done a number of questions where, yes, you, as you, if you struggle during practice time, it's fine. It's practice, it's scope for learning. What have you learned? So it means next time you're not going to repeat the same what? Mistake. That is the importance of doing practice questions as part of your preparatory work. Mistakes are meant for learning and not for repeating. So Charlene, thank you very much for the feedback that the court really motivated you. So don't be afraid of making mistakes. That is the only way we will learn. Assist on a question with 10 marks. I write one page in the question which requires 20 marks, I can write one and a half pages. I'm trying to say I tend to write more content on a low mark question. So I think the abbreviation there is ED, so I hope it's not ED, it's excellence. So I assume it's just ED, my student. So the idea is, as you are doing your practice question, your practice question that is where you are practicing the quantum of things you need to write to end 10 marks. It not just happened by the end the exam. And if you get a 20 mark, 
Essentially, you need to write 20 points if it's a, it's a discussive type of question. If you written 20 points for you to be able to end 20 marks. For a 10 marker, have you written 10 mark points to be able to, to end what? 10 marks. And these are some of the things we are looking at when you then start to mark your own script. If you are writing too much content on a low mark question, ask yourself, why am I writing too much? As I'm writing my, have I done solution planning whereby I'm clear where I'm going to be scoring my points? I'm very clear that to end 10 points, 10 marks, how many points do I need to generate or write? So ED, I would say, practice and be on the lookout of those things when you're revising your practice questions. Okay, Harold, thank you very much for the feedback. So I say I hope that it will at least guide you as you are doing your, your final preps and run into, into your test one. So I think to conclude this session, because I know I've uh, really extended beyond the allocated time, just to emphasize, guys, the onus is upon you to do the work. As CAA, we can never do the work on your behalf. What we can only do is to provide the necessary resources to be, for you to be able to do the adequate work. So it means if you come to me and say, Elliot, I don't have time, my employer does this, or oh, this has happened. I won't be able to do much around that. Because at the end of the day, the onus is upon you to allocate enough time to find the time to do the work that is required. If we give you any activities that you need to do as part of the preparation, please take time to participate. But the people who are giving you those activities, they would enough experience of knowing where a student is struggling. So in order to give you those activities, we know that they are going to help you as part of your preparation and study. So don't do the activity just to say, I want to tick a box. Do it for the purposes of actually learning and help you prepare for whatever assessment that will be coming through. So those are just my parting words as you are doing your preparations. So Felicity asked Mukwazi, asking which items are Please tell us items which are not expected to carry in the exam, e.g. laptop, the do's and the don'ts. So for instance, I, like Fungai has said, in the bulletin, they've been posting the do's and don'ts of the examination. What are the, what are the permitted material to be carried into the exam? Please take time to read those bulletins and information because they contain very important information regarding your life and studies at CAA. And I could see from some of the nature of the questions that I was getting during the course of this session, I could clearly see that we are not reading time, we are not taking time to read those documents. And I thought we we're not going to be true to the African art. You say, if you want to hide anything from a black person, put it in writing or put it in a book. So please prove that adage wrong. Whenever we post or share anything for you guys, please take time to read all the information you already have. So the honor is upon you to go through that information. Happy. So that's it from me, Funga. I don't know if you've got any parting words before we wrap up. Um, I'd like to thank you guys for attending um, this very important session. Uh, and I'm glad that some of you have uh, are giving us positive comments already. I had to really plead with Elliot to, to, for him to accept to do this session. And I'm glad that he, he, he accepted to take time out of his evening to come and speak to you guys as a person with years and years of experience. Um, so I'd like to thank you guys. The recording will be available for you tomorrow. We'll, we'll, we will advise once it has been uploaded. It just has to go through some editing processes and then it will be shared with you. But that should be done by a day and tomorrow. With that said, um, thank you everyone. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, YouTube team. And best wishes in your test one exams. Okay, thank you very much for guys for the kind words, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the rest of your evening. Goodbye. We'll come to the end of our session.